Well, good morning. I'm Samantha Keller, and I'd like to welcome you to today's science exploration series. So when people ask the question, what makes a Notre Dame football weekend so special, everyone imagines that it's the excitement of the game or a great rivalry. But the reality is there's so much more. We hold a series of events to celebrate with our families and friends what the University of Notre Dame has to offer in the classroom and what we do best in the research laboratories every day. In the Science Exploration Series, we feature a series of speakers who present their groundbreaking research from the farthest corners of space to the most complicated processes in the human body. Today, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Jennifer Tank, the Gala Professor in the, Re in the Department of Biological Sciences. She joined the University of Notre Dame in 2000 after working as an assistant professor at the University of Illinois, and she was promoted to full professor in 2010 at Notre Dame. Professor Tank is a key player in defining the emerging field of translational ecology. Her lab's research includes studying the biogeochemistry of streams and rivers through evaluation of nutrient and carbon cycling and the effects of human activities on water quality and ecosystem function. She researches stream restoration and also works at the intersection of agriculture and freshwater science, studying the impacts of conservation on water quality. Because her research is conducted on working lands, her students and collaborators, excuse me, her students and collaborators work directly with farmers, landowners, and natural resource managers to successfully implement projects. Professor Tank is director of the Notre Dame Environmental Change Initiative and past president of the Society for Freshwater Science. Her studies have become foundational works for stream biogeochemistry with almost 200 publications and with more than 21,000 citations. She has received awards for her work, including the, the 2019 Ruth Patrick Award from the Association for Sciences of Limnology and Oceanography. In 2020, she was elected as a fellow of the American Academy for the Advancement of Sciences. Thank you for supporting Notre Dame Science, and please join me in welcoming Dr. Tank. Thank you. Thanks for that great invitation. I appreciate it. What an honor to be here. And um, thank you all for joining me on what is such a beautiful day outside, but you'll be inside for just a little while, and I hope I can tell you a bit about the freshwater ecology that we do here at Notre Dame by talking about a challenge that I think all of you might have heard about at one time or another in the national news. Um, but the first thing I wanted to do is give us a little sense of place, where we are right now. Many of you might not be from around here um, or are just visiting the campus. And I wanted to show you that right now we're part of the St. Joseph River Basin. That's our home watershed here. How many of you have heard of the, the term watershed? Yeah, I, it's great. I would say in 2000, when I started uh, working here at Notre Dame, if I asked that question, very few people raised their hand. But now people really understand what a watershed is. Um, so we're down here in the corner, um, in the corner of this is why it's called South Bend. This is the St. Joseph River running here, this stem. And look at this little lower southern bend before it shoots back north and dumps into Lake Michigan. That's South Bend, Indiana. So that's where we are. And this watershed is pretty special because it's a working watershed. So it is um, uh, a lot of different land use. We have the cities. You can see um, Elkhart. You can see um, uh, uh, further north into Michigan. We span uh, the state of Indiana and Michigan, so it's a little bit special in that way. But the big feature of the St. Joseph River Basin is that it is intensely agriculture. So in some areas of the basin, it's more than 80% agricultural land use. So that intensity of land use is great for our farmers because 
uh, farms in the Midwest and the Corn Belt feed the world, but it also can be challenging for water quality. Um, runoff, agricultural runoff is a key feature um, of uh, um, agriculture in the Midwest, especially during storms and, and, um, and snow melt periods. And that water running off into waterways, moving downstream can cause problems. So that's what we're gonna talk about today, but not just the negative. We're gonna talk a little bit about the positive, which are some of the things that farmers can do uh, to uh, sort of soften the impact on the landscape and our freshwater ecosystems. So today I'm gonna to tell you a story about some challenges. That's the spiral here. That's our water quality challenge. And then this funnel represents what I think are two sort of low hanging fruit uh, uh, choices um, that can help mitigate um, the, those agri agricultural impacts on, on fresh water. So I'm gonna start here with the, with the spiral. And we start with the term dead zone. So how many of you have heard, I imagine, uh, again, the news, you've heard of the term dead zone, right? Um, it's probably a little um, too simple uh, to, to call it a dead zone because it's not really dead, but it is a challenging place uh, or situation for uh, fish, um, shellfish, uh, any organism that needs oxygen, uh, it's gonna be a challenging place to be. And these dead zones, uh, here's a, a really, I mean, the, the, the edge of the dead zone is quite distinct where you see the algal blooms versus no bloom. And this one's from the Gulf of Mexico, but you see dead zones in small lakes, other receiving water bodies. It's not just a feature of something like the Gulf of Mexico that we, that we hear about uh, every year in, in July and August. So it is the canary in the coal mine though. It's the one that makes the national news uh, when it happens. Um, it's actually been happening for a very long time. Um, uh, a group of scientists uh, from uh, uh, Louisiana, LUMCON they're called, it's a, it's a uh, consortium of universities, um, and a woman named Nancy Rabelais, a, a wonderful uh, marine biologist, uh, Nancy Rabelais, has been documenting the size of the dead zone every year. Uh, and she's been working since the mid 80s. And ever since she started measuring, there has been a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. So it's not, it's a recurring phenomenon. It goes up and down in terms of the size of the dead zone, but we are still challenged by something that appears every year that's over 4,000 square miles in area. So this is a massive feature that um, uh, uh, sets up, if you will, in, uh, in, in um, the high, sort of high summer, July, August, every year. Um, it's a long way, though, from South Bend and the Midwest uh, to the Gulf of Mexico, uh, a lot of river miles. Um, but the Corn Belt uh, is, is, is what is challenging uh, the Gulf of Mexico every year. But that feature is not um, just in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, how many of you heard about the challenges in Western Lake Erie Basin of the, the same sorts of algal blooms that happen, happen off the coast of Toledo? Did you all know that Toledo draws its drinking water from Western Lake Erie? They have a water intake structure out in um, the Western Basin. And so when this sets up, uh, that intake structure is, of course, um, taking in contaminated water uh, and, and can threaten water supply. And it's happened periodically over the years. Um, uh, uh, and so this is a lot closer to home for us. This is only a couple hours down the road. But it's the same mechanism. Excess nutrients running off the landscape from agricultural fields fuel algal blooms. Um, and this is what the Maumee River looks like when it blooms. Um, it's quite unbelievable. This is right at the um, uh, mouth uh, going into Western Lake Erie Basin. An in incredible color that's not color enhanced. Um, I put this next to it. How many of you seen Chicago on St. Patrick's Day? Yeah, yeah, that's a dye that they add to the, to the river, but boy, uh, to me, those look very, very similar. It's really an incredible response 
of um, nutrients fertilizing algal growth uh, in the river. And then that, because it's a shallow basin in Western Lake Erie and there's a lot of mixing, you get that algal bloom. It can be seen from space moving all through the Western Basin and threatening water supplies. So these algal blooms, um, this is, that's my hand actually taking that one. Uh, uh, that one's from the web. And, that, and then this shows what the, some of the beaches in Western Lake Erie uh, look like during an algal bloom. You can imagine what this does to the ecosystem, uh, to the organisms that are present, to our fisheries, uh, to tourism. Uh, it just the cascading effects. Um, so it's a challenge that we need to meet while still sustaining the Midwest as the corn belt that feeds the world. So it's a real tension uh, that my lab's been, been working on for um, almost 20 years now. So what actually happens, as I said, it's excess nutrients coming off the landscape, fueling these algal blooms. That's not where the lack of oxygen comes from. In fact, algae produce oxygen, so that's not it. It's what happens to the algae after they're done with their life cycle. They die, and what happens when things die and decompose, right? They start to rob the, the water as the decomposers suck up the oxygen, respire away that carbon. That's when you get no oxygen in the water column. And of course, fish, shellfish, Biota can't live in that no oxygen water column. Those that can move fast enough move out of the dead zone, sort of um, uh, uh, skirt the dead zone. But there are a lot of benthic organisms, things that live on the bottom, non-motile things or slow things that can't move. And that's where we really get uh, uh, sort of a crash in terms of um, fisheries production. So we call that a dead zone. That's how the, how the name came about. So as I mentioned, um, that source of those excess nutrients, you know, I, I, 20 years ago, we probably debated whether or not it was agriculture. Um, and I'm not saying agriculture is the only contributor here, but agriculture at 85% land use in the state of Indiana is a big player, right? But urban uh, uh, runoff um, uh, uh, from um, uh, sewage treatment plants, uh, even you know, what we do on our own lawns, uh, uh, golf courses, uh, football fields, you know, all of these things contribute. But when you have 85% of the land use in a watershed in row crop agriculture, corn and soybeans, and are applying as much nitrogen as we have to apply um, in order to get the kind of yields that we get in the corn belt, um, this is the, a, a big part of the story and, and a good place to look for how can we tweak the system to make improvements. So corn and soybeans are very intense in this part. Here we are right here in South Bend, very intense in this part of the Corn Belt. And, and right here, as I mentioned, right here was uh, the St. Joseph River Basin. That's at the edge of Indiana and Michigan. We're actually right on the edge. If you go a little bit west in town, you jump over um, into the Kankakee River Basin that flows into the Mississippi River and down to the Gulf of Mexico. So it's really ironic. I love, kind of embrace it. We sit both in the Great Lakes Basin as well as in um, the Mississippi River Basin. So corn, of course, as you know, needs quite a lot of love uh, in order to produce. In order to get the type of yields we get around here, it's about a pound of nitrogen per bushel. Um, that's just a rule of thumb you, thumb you can think about. So around here, 200 bushels per acre would be top, top yields. That's really top farmland. That means they're applying about 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre to the land in order to get those kinds of yields. So we have to apply the nitrogen in order for that corn to grow. The problem is things happen in between applying that nitrogen and the corn taking up all that fertilizer that can lose some of that nitrogen to uh, waterways. And in fact, we know that about 50% of that nitrogen in, any, in, in larger watersheds, about 50% is the rule of thumb of nitrogen, nitrate nitrogen runs off. So if we're applying 200 pounds per acre, 100 pounds of that is ending up uh, uh, down system. So it's, um, that's where our challenge lies. 
So here's the runoff. This is what you see this all the time around here. Um, how many of you are from kind of near here where you might see an agricultural ditch overflowing um, during spring snowstorms, spring uh, rainstorms or rain on snow events? This happens. There's not any real way uh, to avoid uh, the precipitation and snow melt that we get in the spring. It's a very vulnerable period. And farmers don't want to lose what's on their fields to the waterways either. It's not good business. It's not good for the soils. It's not good for their farms. Uh, so this is something that we want to try and avoid, this runoff, especially during storms. So what I've set up for you, and here finally is our Mississippi River Basin. Did you all know it was that big? It's two-thirds of the contiguous uh, uh, United States. It's really huge. This is the Missouri, Missouri River Basin here that's flowing in Ohio over here. It's ginormous. And here we are. Look at right. That's it. That's us right at the very, very edge. Uh, and, but this, is, this yellow area represents agriculture, and you can see we're in part of the intensely agricultural part of the Mississippi River Basin. And here's that uh, uh, Gulf of Mexico area where um, the Mississippi hits um, uh, the Gulf of Mexico. And so the challenge really is, well, we've changed the landscape. We've changed the vegetation type to corn and soybeans. Uh, we've lost our filters. Um, uh, in the way that we drain the landscape. And so now we've made a system that's, that's particularly vulnerable. So our challenge is really how do we sustain productive agriculture in the Midwest um, and minimize uh, this nutrient runoff? So that's the challenge that we're facing. So this is where my lab comes in. Um, we've been working on um, streams and rivers in the agricultural Midwest on how uh, conservation practices, choices that farmers make, uh, can improve water quality in these heavily agricultural areas. And the two ways we've been looking at it is through year-round vegetation or winter cover crops um, and, whoopsie, oh, wait, there it is, and floodplains as filters. So modifying our waterways, especially the tiny waterways, so they're a little bit more spongy uh, for nutrients before things move uh, downstream. So I'm going to talk to you about those today in this sort of funnel that we're talking about. First, starting with what we can do on the landscape, what farmers can do on the landscape, and then talking about what we might do to our waterways uh, to improve them, to, to to get more towards that funnel where we're reducing the nitrogen leaving the landscape so things are better um, at, at the outlet. So on fields, let's talk about winter cover crops. Um, how many of you have seen around November, December, as you drive around the Midwest, anywhere in the Midwest, fields that look a little bit more like uh, the left-hand side? <laughs> It's bare ground, right? It's after harvest. You know that they've harvested the corn and the soybeans, and those fields are fallow waiting for the next year's crop. We see it all the time. Um, what we're uh, off, uh, offering as an alternative, which is becoming more popular, is to plant something else on the ground that keeps those fields covered in the off season, during the fallow season. So this would be sort of a November to April uh, covering. And most of this is just ryegrass. So cover crops are, you can plant a lot of different species. You can do diverse mixes, but the very easiest thing to do is just to plant an annual or cereal ryegrass and just let it sit. They've got deep, deep roots, really deep roots. That's that middle. I think my pointer um, lost its battery. Uh, the, the deep root systems are shown in the middle column um, that retain, uh, retain uh, those nutrients. They hold the soil in, especially during runoff. And that plant, at least for part of the year, is growing and taking up that nitrate nitrogen, the nitrogen that we don't want in the runoff. So that's a way. But I often say to the farmers that we work with, don't concern yourself with what's above ground. It doesn't really matter if it looks scruffy, messy, 
not even, it doesn't look like a lawn perfectly green because what matters is below ground. It's the below ground root systems that keep that nitrate, nitrogen uh, in the fields. And this is one of my students, Matt, from former students, Matt, showing how deep those root systems go. About a meter on average uh, are these root systems of the ryegrass and that really keeps the nitrogen in place. So what we did, uh, we worked for five years in a small watershed in Kosciuszko County, Indiana. Uh, we still work there, but this was a particular um, project that was funded by the U.S. Department of Agriculture called a Regional Conservation Partnership Program. And it, partnership is the key word. We couldn't have done this without the partnership of the farmers in this small watershed. And what we did was incentivize the planting of cover crops. And when I say incentivize, what do I mean? I mean, we paid them $45 an acre to plant cover crops during the five years of the project. So these are folks, some folks maybe had thought about cover crops, maybe others were like, Meh, not worth the change. You know, that money to try it out um, was enough of an incentive to bring the percent coverage in our watershed um, almost to 70% uh, in the first watershed, which is the Chateau Ditch. Um, we also worked in, a, in a, a second watershed a little bit farther um, west in the state. That land was rented mostly rather than owned by the farmers that were farming it. And it was a little harder to get uh, the cover crops on the ground. We did achieve a high of about 25%. Um, those numbers probably don't mean a lot unless I give you, uh, or I would like you to actually guess what the average cover crop coverage is in the state of Indiana. Now, let me set the stage. Um, Indiana is called one of the leaders of the 50 states, the leaders in cover crop coverage in the country, one of the leaders. Okay, how many people think we're at 90% cover crop coverage in the state? Nobody. 75%. 40%. Oh, we got some 40%. You guys are optimists. Awesome. Okay, I'm going down to 25. Anybody 25? Oh, it's 25. Getting more realistic. 10%. <laughs> you guys know the answer. It's 10%. So we are leading the way in the country at 10% cover crop coverage in the state. So that, that's a lot of land that probably could be cover cropped in the off season. Um, so we're a ways uh, from making this something that's a best practice that everyone uses, but um, we've provided a, a lot of good data that show it can work. So back to the experiment, um, this uh, lower right hand picture is a picture of what our cover crops actually look like in the watershed. I love that picture because that's the high point in the watershed, I mean literally. <laughs> It's like the tiniest hill in one of the fields <laughs> looking back down. But that doesn't really um, tell you how many acres we got on the ground. Um, so we got almost 2,000 acres on the ground. Still probably doesn't mean anything to you all. I know acres don't mean much to me either. So I converted it to football fields. We put in 672 football fields worth of cover crops for five years. So this was a, a, a project that was designed to show if, it, if we could maximize the coverage, what would we get in terms of improvement? How good could we get in terms of minimizing runoff? Well, let me tell you the take home on that one. Cover crops do minimize nutrient runoff. If there's green on the ground, it's not even rocket science to think about that. If there's a green crop on the ground, it's going to hold back nutrients and sediments instead of running off during storms and snow melts. It's not, it's not surprising, but we had to document that. And we had students out for five years, year round, every two weeks, sampling those fields and uh, the subsurface tile drains that leave the fields and then the waterways themselves. We, they became great friends with the farmers, <laughs> you know, as they got my truck stuck periodically in one place or another place in the watershed, they'd come out with the gator, you know, and, and or even on super cold days, someone would come out with some hot chocolate. It was just lovely. So um, these students learned a lot. They bonded with each other. They got some great publications out of it, and they documented some amazing results. And what the take home is, it's up and down year to year, right? Depending on if it's a very wet year versus a very dry year like this year. Um, but compared to fields um, with just bare soil, those with cover crops have 80% less nitrate nitrogen loss 
coming off of them uh, compared to bare soil. So it really does work. Put some green on the ground and you will retain uh, fertilizer uh, nitrogen on the field. So um, that's, our, that's our big take home there. Yeah? If they're retaining more of the ground, does that reduce the amount of nitrogen they have to use for the next year's crop? It's a great question. It's a great question. Um, it, we think it does. We have papers on the soil sampling of those fields showing that the, um, the nitrogen in the soils is going up. The leaky form of nitrogen associated with the soils, nitrate nitrogen, is going down. So the vulnerable part is going down, but the stuff that's stuck in organic nitrogen is going up as well as carbon. Um, but it's hard when fertilizer is your insurance. <laughs> and to ask a farmer to apply less of that insurance for a really big year when they could get top yields is really a, a, a challenge. But it's, a, it's the million dollar question that you've asked, so it's great. Okay, so the possibility that we can hold uh, fertilizer nutrients on the field is there, and I've shown you those data. But the likelihood that some is gonna run off is of course there. How can we now make the waterways a little more spongy so they hold back nitrogen as well before it moves downstream? That's our second practice that we've been working on uh, to document the potential benefits to water quality. And these are, um, the project is restoring floodplains in these waterways. So what you see on the top left hand is what the ditches in Indiana look like. They are managed to be straight as an arrow and trapezoidal in shape. They're like pipes. And um, the county surveyors in the state spend a lot of time and effort um, dredging these ditches to keep them straight and narrow because what Mother Nature wants to do is do this. Mother Nature wants to make the curve. Um, that's not uh, the fastest way for the water to move off the landscape and so they do a lot of management uh, to keep them deep uh, and trapezoidal in shape. And there are tens of thousands of miles of ditch in the state of Indiana that are managed just like this. The practice we've been working on is a little bit of a twist, an alternative to that, that takes a note from Mother Nature, floodplains, and says, can we think about these waterways just a little bit differently? And so yes, they're still straight, but instead of straight and shaped like a trapezoid, they have a mini floodplain on either side. Um, that mini floodplain is a lot like the floodplains you see in natural streams and rivers. When water floods, it flows out onto the floodplain and slows down instead of flowing straight down like a pipe with so much force and potential damage. Um, what this looks like is, is um, there's the Chateau Ditch. Uh, this is the same watershed we've been working in uh, as our demonstration project site. Um, top right is the channelized ditch before we constructed. Um, middle is as we were constructing. So you see we're just pulling away the soil to create a little mini floodplain, widening the ditch shape by three, it makes it about three times as wide, and creating that mini floodplain. And then after one growing season, you don't, you don't really see any difference. It looks just a little bit more natural with uh, those grasses on that floodplain. But boy, does it do some work. Let, let me show you. So here's some of that um, construction. We're now, we started with a half mile in 2007, and at the end of the USDA project, we had 4.1 miles uh, in the Chateau Ditch. That's as many miles as we can get in this small waterway without pulling out trees and forest. So we're at the max. It's the longest in the world. So if you want to visit someplace locally famous, you can go to the Chateau Ditch. <laughs> it's got a big sign uh, 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 at, the, at the road crossing. So um, uh, we're, we're excited about it. We put as much in as we could to show what the maximum water quality benefit you could get from putting two-stage ditch in. So you've got the construction. You can see it down in the lower left. The main channel is there by those fringes of grass. You see that? And then the floodplain is out to the right. And you can see that light, this light color here in the lower uh, corner of this picture, that's new sand and sediment being deposited on those floodplains. It's not even really biology yet. It's simply hydraulics. When you um, uh, uh, create a floodplain, the water spreads out onto that floodplain, slows down, and when it slows down, it doesn't have the power to hold the sediment in suspension, and it drops out onto the floodplain. 
Um, and then lower right is what it looks like now, which is, is quite natural and the water clarity is really uh, improved. Oh, I guess somebody's going to ask, so I might as well tell you, how much does that cost? Uh, it costs $10 a foot, $10 a linear foot, um, which I thought was expensive. Um, uh, that's a backhoe. I mean, it's a, it's, it takes um, skill to do. Uh, I just think of how, I guess where my mind goes is $10 a foot is not that expensive, but when you add up all the thousands and thousands and thousands of feet that there are in, of, of linear ditch around uh, the state of Indiana, it seemed daunting. But um, one of the county surveyors uh, said it to me. It was actually one of the storm managers. There are a lot of folks that, um, there's a lot of MS4 money from EPA spent on storm protection. And he said, do you have any idea how much a new um, uh, wastewater treatment plan costs? <laughs> I said, no, I, I don't. He's like, you know, tens of millions of dollars for one, for one community. So this, Jen, is not expensive. So I've changed my tune. This is not expensive. It's extremely reasonable. Uh, but we probably have to change the way we think about managing our waterways to make a difference. Okay, so what does it do? Again, there's the take home point. Floodplains work, especially during storms. And here's what they do. So this is a 200 year flood event that we captured here. So you say, what's a 200 year flood event? Well, it used to be, it's a flood recurrence interval. It's how big those flows get. How often should that occur in the full history of a, of a waterway? Well, a 200 year event's supposed to be once in every 200 years. Well, we've gotten a 200 year event every year since 2010 in this system. So things are changing. No longer, that is no longer a 200 year event, but it's dang big. And, and what we're seeing is, do you see how that system is holding the water? It's not sending it downstream in a brown rush uh, that looks like a pipe. Instead, it's spreading out, slowing down, and doing some work before it leaves. And the water clarity is greatly improved because as it hits those floodplains, the sediments fall out. And the water clarity um, uh, uh, becomes distinctly different, and you're not sending all that sediment-rich water downstream. Um, so that turbid, that's the, the thing we measure it with is a turbidity sensor. We've got a real-time sensor deployed out there taking measurements every 10 minutes. 80% of the turbidity is reduced in that system due to those floodplains. So they really become much clearer and that improved water clarity is tied to improved water quality. And wider is more biology. Frankly, again, not you're saying to yourself, boy, she doesn't do very complicated work, does she? <laughs> no, it's not complicated, but nobody had shown it before. If you triple the width of a system and it's filled with soil microbes, plants, just more biology, it's going to do more work on the water before it moves downstream. And that's what's represented in the right hand of this figure. The left is that, that, that um, uh, stream on its way down after a flood, so you can see the, the floodplains being revealed. But on the right is the end removal capacity. And those light green caps on every bar is the additional nitrogen removal potential that was added by tripling the width and adding those floodplains. So it's 3 to 24 times higher in streams with floodplains than those without. So it just makes sense to think about our waterways a little differently. So can these changes make a difference? Well, in a small watershed where we put four miles and 70% coverage of cover crops, we call that stacking two practices together. Um, they really have made a difference. But this is just a small uh, 3,000 acre watershed of millions of acres of farmland. Uh, that are challenged by uh, uh, this the juxtaposition between agriculture and fresh water. Um, I think the biggest, I, I think they're low-hanging fruit. We got a lot of miles of ditch that we could manage differently. We've got a lot of acres of land that are fallow in the winter season that could have cover crops. But I think what's going to be the game changer is when we start talking about carbon and carbon credits for farmers to be part of the climate change solution. Uh, that's when cover crops will really come into the mix. And we could possibly even get floodplains in there as well. Floodplains should get, I mean, they're flowing wetlands. If wetlands get carbon credits, then floodplains should get carbon credits. So you could think about how this whole carbon market 
that is aimed at farmers could really be a game changer. But I pasted just a few headlines uh, on this, and you can see it's not straightforward. Um, it's not a foregone conclusion that doing X, like cover crops, is going to make a difference in terms of carbon storage. We're not quite there yet. There's a lot of work to be done, a lot of controversy on whether carbon goes up or stays the same. It doesn't ever really go down with conservation, so it's always going to be a neutral. But it's a, there's a cost in changing behavior. Uh, there's a cost in doing things differently, and so you have to somehow incentivize to make the change. Um, so uh, I think the carbon markets, um, and that's where our research is headed now. We've got um, Eddy Flux Towers, which are basically big instrumentation um, on uh, fields with and without cover crops that are looking at carbon exchange. And then we're measuring the carbon that's leaving those fields and trying to do sort of a, a, a balance, uh, a budget, if you will, on whether or not car cover crops make a difference. So that's where we're headed next. Because I think, not that I don't love nitrogen and phosphorus, those are my, those are my thing, but um, I can see the writing on the wall and, and, and this is where the change is going to come. And then finally, we need to scale up in order to make a difference. Whatever we do, we can't do it piecemeal in little bits and pieces. Um, I heard, uh, he was my mentor at University of Illinois before I left, um, uh, Mark David, um, his very insightful quote that I always, um, I should probably get it tattooed somewhere, um, it's too long, I don't have any tattoos either, so, <laughs> um, oversharing, uh, but uh, the, the idea that um, not every square inch of ground um, is right for cover crops, or two-stage ditch or what, but every square inch of ground needs something. You know, I paraphrase the quote, but the point is, is we need to treat every square inch of agricultural ground with some sort of practice that minimizes uh, runoff, improves carbon storage if we're gonna make a difference. And there's incredible potential out there, but we just have to make the change across the board. So do it at scale. So, what I've shown you today is that we're at a point where we've got this issue with the dead zone. Um, there are, you know, task forces with the federal government saying we re need to reduce it to X. We need to, dip, you know, good goals, right? But I personally believe, especially in light of climate change and sort of the type of weather and extreme events that are coming down the pipe, we need to get to the bottom. We need to get to the ideal situation where we can keep what we apply on the landscape on the landscape in order to both protect the fresh water as well as our, our marine and coastal systems. And what I think is the future of all that, I'll probably be dead and gone before we solve the problem, but um, we've been sowing the seeds of change uh, at Notre Dame for over 20 years. So this is, um, my group's been working at the interface of land use and fresh water since 2000, and these are where my former graduate students have ended up. Um, they're all over the country now, they're all working in one way or another on the way humans change the landscape and how that impacts fresh water and how we can can change things to make a difference. So super proud of where they've been. They've now got their students. I'm probably old enough that my first students have had students who now have students. <laughs> so I think we're carrying on uh, uh, the change. Um, it, it's, pretty, it's pretty exciting. Um, so that student training in this translational space, this space where you're working with farmers to do the work, you're co-producing the knowledge, um, it requires patience, it requires respect, right? We, we, no one needs to let us on their land. That's a gift of that partnership that we need to be um, incredibly, incredibly tender with that, uh, with that partnership. So what I tell my students, they always say, I've, I've learned so many communication skills, I've learned so much better way to interact with people, to understand people's points of view that are coming from a completely different space than mine. They learn so many real world skills in working in these agricultural streams that 20 years ago I would have said, really, I have to work in ag streams? I'd rather work in the Tetons. <laughs> you know, so I realize now this has been a gift in disguise. Um, I always say to them, their, their science matters. Don't ever forget it, but you've got to make it translatable and understandable to anyone. 
uh, in order for it to do its job. Be a generous partner. No one owes us access to these systems. It's a gift. Number three, stay the course. It's long. Uh, it's a long road, uh, but, but we'll make change in the end. And finally, um, I really think if you love what you do, uh, you don't ever work a day uh, in your life. So that's what I tell them. Find your passion uh, and follow it. So with that, um, thank you for being here. I know you've got lots on your plate and finally go Irish, but I'd be happy to answer any questions if I can. Oh yeah, sorry, yeah, I'll grab this and then this one. Oh, oh. In this area. Yeah. Do you guys have any underwater, I'm from California, so a lot of the Central Valley depends on aquifers and things like that. Does Indiana cover a lot of aquifers? And so we're a little different. We have almost, we, we're on the order of too much, too much water. So instead of having to really go for groundwater in order to irrigate, what we're doing is putting in um, those subsurface tile drains, that white pipe that stuck out in one of those pictures. Um, those are all over uh, these fields. And what they do is it's, a, it's an underground network of slotted tiles that drain the excess water and shoot it out to the stream so that the fields are dry. Otherwise, this would be wetland. So all of this area is just a big wetland of, of uh, either Lake Michigan or, uh, or Lake Erie. We would not be arable or farmable land uh, if we didn't have the subsurface tile drain. So we're a little different. Instead, we're shortcutting the groundwater and getting it out into the ditches uh, in order to farm, which is sort of the reverse problem than, than California has. You have the deep aquifers in order to actually keep agriculture going. Yep, yep, so it's a little bit, but they have the same challenges. Once you put the water on the landscape, you get the same runoff issues uh, in the Central Valley as, as we have. So the solutions are not different, really. Once the water is applied, how do you keep the stuff you want on the landscape and let the stuff that doesn't need to be there? Yeah, because it's over pumping the water. Oh my gosh, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yep, yep. I, Actually, we're doing groundwater. Uh, we're touching on the water cycle in my class on Tuesday. And there was a fantastic New York Times article in late August on the groundwater crisis that has all these great interactive maps and uh, uh, am amazing New York Times story on our groundwater crisis. And California is the bullseye of all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're going to be the canary in the coal mine that makes us change. So it's, uh, it's, it's awesome. Yeah. Well, awesome that you have a progressive way to change. Yeah, you get what I mean. Yeah, not awesome. Yeah, yeah, very complicated. Yeah. You. I just was curious what research is being done to reduce the amount of nitrogen they have to use. Well, it's super interesting. So um, you don't. Yeah. So plant breeding is probably not focusing on reducing um, uh, nitrogen application and. Um, we just had to look this up recently because I've got a, a watershed modeler in my group and he, a postdoc and Mo is working on a model for the St. Joe River Basin to show how much benefit could we get if we put cover crops on on every square inch, you know, and this is a big basin now, versus uh, what that nitrogen benefit, what reduction in fertilizer application would make the same difference. You're not going to believe the answer. I mean, it's going down like by 2%, 2%, 2% would make the difference. <laughs> but to ask farmers to buy 2% or 5% less, apply that much, it's just very risky. And, and to show them, especially with a model, you got to do this and believe my model. Again, you know, it's just very challenging. But the way the curves look is you get all this growth with nitrogen application and then there's this, it's this flat line, we're, we're out here because in a big year, you might need it all. And so there really isn't, we know what corn does with nitrogen application, but they still say for insurance purposes, uh, apply more. Yeah, and it's very cheap. If, if nitrogen fertilizer cost what it costs the environment on the opposite side, um, the whole game would, would change. Um, but that's big agribusiness and way beyond my, this is when I get way out of my, you know, and say something that somebody's going to send me an email about. So, yeah, yeah, 
Yeah. Well, just considering the cost factor, because if, you know, we, we live actually on the eastern part of that watershed. We're in Kendallville. So um, driving over here this morning, we drove through all of that space. Yeah. So a couple of things. First of all, like the, the economic factors are definitely a, a big deal. But looking at the two-stage ditches, mm -hmm. it would seem to me that in flood time, the crop loss that is mitigated by that two-stage ditch would probably... You're 100, you're 100 percent right. And that was the whole motivation for the design of the two-stage ditch. So I'm in so impressed that you remembered two-stage ditch, too, because it's kind of a dumb name. But thank you. Thank you for that. Um, it was uh, Andy Ward, who since passed. He was a professor and agricultural engineer at Ohio State University. And he's the one that came up with and named the, um, the two-stage ditch. And it was all about pre preventing bank slumping during high flow events. So preventing farmers from losing land when a ditch ran too big and, and pulled big chunks of fields into the waterway. So that's what it was designed for. We came in and said, don't design it for the 200 year event. Design it so that it floods. Floodplains are low enough that they flood every time it rains and you'll get additional benefit. And that's where we came in and partnered with Andy. He was one of my first collaborators on, on this work. And it does make a difference, but the problem is who pays for the ditch to put it in? That's farmer money, they pay, and they not only have to pay the $10 per linear foot to build it, which sometimes they can get subsidized. There is a cost share program that gives 70% cost share, so that's a good incentive. And so that's not the hurdle. The backhoe getting it in, not the hurdle, $10 a linear foot. What's the hurdle is that strip of land that they're going to lose by tripling the width. That little strip of land that could have been farmed is now not farmable, and nobody will pay for that. And so we've been talking to USDA, Farm Services Ag um, Agency, so the federal government, hard to find who is the right person to talk to. If anybody knows anybody at the top, please let me know. Um, but the Nature Conservancy has been helping us sort of with their ag lobbyists, et cetera, to think about how do we change the incentive structure. So if you say treated them like flowing wetlands, they could get wetland conservation reserve money for those permanent wetlands that will never go back to farming, get paid, and then that investment makes a difference. But right now, any farmer who puts in a two-stage ditch is basically gifting that land, and there are very few farmers that have that kind of liquidity, if you will, from their most valuable resource, their land, to put that out of production and into, into floodplain. So you hit the nail on the head on this, really. Yeah. Um, so with so many um, like ecological and agricultural benefits to cover cropping, I'm curious why we're only seeing like 10% in the best state in the United States and like what some of the barriers to cover cropping are? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so uh, the barriers, it, it, there are a lot of benefits, um, but the bottom line is it's an it's a, um, asking of uh, farmers to do more. Do you see what I mean? They, they, they're ready to be done and ready to move on to what they do in the fallow season, which is a lot. Um, they don't want to think about pl planting something else. And in fact, you don't plant cover crops in November just way after harvest. You plant them in August in between the, the growing corn or soybeans. So, I mean, it's a lot. You either fly them on or you have high boys, special equipment. It's, it's just a lot. And then you have to terminate them in April. You have to worry about them all through, right, all through. And then you have to terminate them in April. So it's a whole different product. You have... The farmers that buy into it really are farmers that are seeing other benefits. They're not doing it for water quality. That's an ancillary co-benefit. What they're doing it for is they believe, and we've documented it, that there is a change in the soil quality if you do it. And it's about a 0.1% change in soil organic matter per year. 0.1 isn't really measurable from noise. 1%, which takes 10 years to get to, that's my advanced math, 10 times 0.1, 10 times 0.1, 1, 1% uh, 1 change over 10 years, that matters to them. That's a big change, but that means you got to be in for 10 years to see the benefit. So it really takes a farmer that really has got the sort of long, you know, these are the early adopters, if you will. So I would call the 10% of farmers in Indiana that are doing it right now, 
or 10% of land, I don't know how, what percent of farmers it is, but 10% of land, those are the early adopters. So I'm hoping that it'll catch on, uh, but, but that's some of the, it's really a financial and time uh, uh, challenge, yeah. I've heard the, the sorry. I've heard the radish crop cover. Crop. Yeah. Is that like is that does that carry the same type of benefit or not as much? Um, there's differences across the different types of cover crops. Radish in particular doesn't overwinter. Um, it there, there's um, different nitrogen. Whether the nitrogen benefit is the same, but it's like. I'm, we're talking the little, this is the bumps. Like, I, put something on the ground. Something is better than nothing. So I never say, oh, do this over this. And in fact, that big experiment, that big project we did, um, we didn't tell the farmers what to plant. They converged on some form of ryegrass because they all talked to each other, but it wasn't us. We said, just plant anything, anything, because farmer choice, you know. And so, yes, there are differences. You know, I would argue, if I'm an ecologist, I would say put in something more diverse, a 13-way mix instead of one single species. You may have likelihood of better coverage, but it's more, the seed is way, way, way more expensive than ryegrass. So all these choices are nuances in the practices that have to make sense for the farmer financially. Yeah. I think there was a question. So when you pursue these interventional studies like the dishes or cover crops, how do you typically control for things like year-over-year -year variation in weather? I obviously, the effect sizes were pretty big, but how do you sort of control these? Oh, I love your use of effect size. I know how you're thinking. I totally get it. Um, yeah, if you're exactly right, and it has to be long term. That's the that's the thing. If we had only done the work for three years, we just couldn't show it. So the 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 challenge of of sustaining projects for a long period, long enough period of time to, in natural systems, see the signal through this. That's what we need to do: is see the signal through the noise. And the noise, because of climate change, is getting more and more and more. So we got to be able to stay the course. And so that's that. That's that long game I'm talking about. And when you use the long game, even though, like, if I had had a student who had only studied the effect of cover crops in a year like this year, which is a super dry year, those tile drains are dry. Not only would we not be able to say much about cover crops. But the tiles aren't even flowing, and they aren't even getting data, right? Thank God we have a much longer data set that our students can work with. So it's really about long-term projects. And the same on the soil organic matter piece. If we only had a three-year soil study, that 0.3% change, people are going to say, that's noise. I don't care about 0.3%. It's being there for 10 years, sampling the same fields gets us 1%, and then people start listening. So the value of long-term studies is really long answered. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Are you getting much advocacy from the ag agricultural extension offices around the state, like Purdue Agriculture Extension, also from the youth groups like 4-H and Future yeah. Farmers, who could advocate then to their parents, uh, yeah. farmers? Yeah. So I. Um, so. Uh, n n um, <laughs> none of you are from. Uh, how many? Is anyone from Purdue? Gonna be honest with me? Okay. So, all right. Uh, yeah, well, we're in the house, right? This is Notre Dame, right? I can talk. Okay, so the issue is whenever I go out and talk in front of farmers, the first thing someone, always someone asks is, don't, do you collaborate? Who at, Notre, who at Purdue is doing this work? You know, it's like when Purdue does it, then you know what I mean? But we've been in this long enough that Notre Dame's got its name now, which is, which is great. People are paying attention. We've had fantastic support. Our key partners is through the soil and water conservation districts in the state. We have a very strong soil and water conservation district network in the state, and they're our biggest, and they are often farmers themselves. They're our biggest proponents. And every county has a soil and water conservation district annual dinner and I've been on that speaker circuit for years, and you go, and the very, very most motivated and nodding in the audience folks are the future farmers of America. The kids are there, and they're like, you don't have to tell me about cover crops. I know about cover crops. You don't have to tell me about two-stage ditches. I'm going to Purdue, and I'm going to study ag engineering, and God, when those kids graduate, that's when things will change. So I think we're on our way. Um, uh, and, and it really, what I think we've shown is we needed the data. You can't tell people the story. You have to show them the numbers in order and publish the research so there's something that people can refer to that shows, yeah, it really does make a difference. So I think we're, we're getting there. <laughs> okay, I guess last question, and then I'll let you guys go. Yeah. What's the type of algae that's 
travel including sick Joseph Moore shows? Oh, such a good question. I wish I was an algal person to tell you. Um, so the um, cyanobacteria, when you see these blooms, uh, sort of big blooms, they're often cyanobacteria. They're, they're the blue-green algae. Yeah, so that's, that's what you see. And those are the ones we worry about because they have the associated toxins. But it's really, really hard to predict what a certain runoff cocktail is going to give in terms of a bloom. Um, but I wouldn't say all algal blooms are bad. So sometimes in the spring, you'll often see a little flush of green in these small waterways. And it's just because there's enough, it, temperatures are warming up, the leaf canopy hasn't closed, and all the really good algae are getting a little boost. So not all algal blooms are bad. It's when they're massive and, and overwhelming and nothing else is there that, that we have to worry. But it's a, it's a great question. Yeah, thanks. Okay, thanks, y'all. Have a great day today. Go Irish. Yeah.